Good afternoon. My name is Paula Carey and I'm Chief Justice of the Trial Court in Massachusetts. And I'm here today with Pamerson Eiffel, who is our Deputy Commissioner for Pretrial Services and our Probation Department. In Massachusetts, our Probation Department uh, exists within the trial court organization. So we are delighted to be here today to talk to you about some of the uh, things that we do to celebrate cultural appreciation in the Massachusetts trial court and to really give you some tips about why we think it's important uh, to engage not only your own staff, but to engage your communities. Before we begin our presentation, we're dedicating our presentation in memory of the Honorable Ralph Gantz. For those of you that don't know, we lost our Chief Justice about two weeks ago, and uh, a very bright light was extinguished. Uh, he was a beacon in our community. Uh, he was uh, not only in our community, but in the national community, and he always shone a light towards justice and equity. He was a true champion of racial justice and access to justice. Um, and related to our work today, you see one quote we put in our slides, but I'd, I'd like to give you another quote. Um, and he always used to ask us, ask each of us to answer this important question. Are we treating the rich the same as the poor? The white is same as the black and brown? The citizen is same as the immigrants? And where the answer is no, we need to be willing to handle the truth and dedicate ourselves to making the changes necessary to ensure that the answer is yes. Right. So Chief, we dedicate our efforts to that. Chief, and I just, you know, I, you know, Chief Justice Gant was one of those impressive people who really, when he spoke about issues of race and racial disparity, you know, there, there was no doubt in that he meant what he was talking about. And I found this to be one of the, I, I've used it, we've used this quote, we need to learn the truth behind this trouble and disparity as he examined issues of race and racial disparity. But we need a, the courage and the commitment to handle the truth. And I think a lot of all of all of his work was built around this desire to find out what the truth is. And so, you know, he will be missed. We, we've lost our leader and our beacon for somebody who really stood up for racial justice. And that was one of the more powerful memories that I have of him. So thank you. And speaking of courage, uh, a, a, a report was issued by Harvard University that was commissioned by Chief Justice Gantz in 2016. It took them a bit of time to complete it about racial disparity within the criminal justice system in Massachusetts. Unfortunately, the report was issued a week before he died, approximately a week before he died. So his vision in addressing these issues now falls on us and we're firmly committed to be able to addressing the issues raised in that report. If you haven't read it, uh, it's an important step, but he had the courage to open up our, our justice system and our data certainly in the trial court to be analyzed in terms of racism and disparities that exist within, our, within not only our system, but the entire criminal justice system. So we thought we'd begin to talk a little bit about what our mission is. Uh, the mission as we've defined it uh, in the trial court, which is fair and impartial administration of justice, protection of constitutional uh, and statutory rights and liberties, um, equal access to justice for all in a safe and dignified environment with policies and practices that strengthen and support diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that's not so easy to do all the time. It forces you to really take a look at each and every policy that you have uh, and really look at it from an equity lens, look at it from a racial lens. Um, and it takes practice to be able to do that. The efficient and effective and accountable resolution of disputes and prompt and courteous service to the public by committed and dedicated professionals utilizing best practices in a manner that inspires public trust and confidence. And everything we talk about today is really key into that mission. And we're describing some of the initiatives that we do uh, to, uh, to accomplish those objectives. Okay. So the next slide, really, we want you to, to when we're thinking about what we're doing in terms of our work around diversity and equity and inclusion, we really want you to understand that a big part of our focus is our executive leadership. We know that in order for diversity and equity and inclusion to be successful, that you have to have an engaged leadership that can lay out the pathways, that can determine what how the levels of accountability that we've built into the process work. So. We believe that it's important that we have leadership at the table driving that and holding 
all other aspects of the organization accountable. We want to build an adaptive organizational culture around cultural competency and proficiency. We see these as important components when it comes to serving and meeting the needs of, of, of a diverse population. So what do we mean when we talk about an adaptive organizational culture? You, you, 50 years, 20 years, 25 years ago, when we were talking about diversity, we were really focusing on, on the issues of race. But we believe, you know, when you look at the, the different dimensions of diversity, there are 20 different dimensions within that. And so we wanted to make sure that as an organization that we address issues, whether you're, you're Black, White, Latino, Asian, gay, straight, um, different folks from different um, religious backgrounds or physical abilities, we wanted to make sure that the organization could address all of those needs across the dimension diversity spectrum. We know that data-driven analysis and the use of metrics are important because we want to be able to measure where we're at. We, may be able to, we need to be able to analyze where we're at. What does the data tell us about our current organization? How are we servicing and meeting the needs of individuals? And we need to new, use data in a way that it holds us accountable to all aspects of diversity as we move forward. We also wanted to make sure that diverse that we wanted a diverse multi-level employee involvement and participation. We meaning we want every person from every level, from entry level right through to the highest level of judicial judicial leadership involved in our work around diversity, equity, inclusion. And we have that here in our trial court system. We wanted to make sure that we know that all hands on deck when we are talking about issues of diversity. The other parts that we want you to leave with today really are the essential takeaways. And we think we go to the point that an informed commitment to diversity and equity and inclusion are essential factors in delivering justice with dignity and speed. So, so we really want a court system that understands the needs of diverse populations that come before it, that is reflective, that understands the types of resources that exist. And we want to be able to provide it to our communities. Um, this one, the, our next line, the trial court seeks to ensure fair and equal access to the court system through a diverse workforce that is reflected of the communities we serve. And we think this is where the power is here in Massachusetts. On, on average, uh, um, we want to make sure that when you walk through our front door, that the people who serve you, whether it is on the, on the bench, whether it is at the probation counter or the clerk's counter, we want to make sure that there's a level of self-identification in the individuals that are serving you and that you're going before. And, and, and there's the, the power in all of that is, is that we want folks to be able to understand that we understand their lived experience because we share their same culture, ideas, and values. Um, so what our cultural proficiency champions are, there are more than 225 employees in the trial court who have been trained on every, every, every area from race in racial justice or race and racial and ethnic disparity. They're trained on LGBTQIA issues. They're trained on physical ability, disabilities, and they're trained across the diversity spectrum to be able to engage not only themselves, but also to be able to engage their colleagues about different aspects of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our champions promote behaviors and practices that lend themselves to inclusion and connectivity. And these are all shared trial court values that we're looking to make sure we model, that we bring across within the system and to ensure that when we really talk about inclusion, that inclusion means that every employee within the trial court has a voice, is valued, have an input on any decision-making process that we have. So that is part of what our champions are working. We are also looking to integrate and interact with our communities to ensure that we uh, provide equal access to justice, um, through better involved discussions. We've got any number of trial court engagement sessions the chief will be talking about, but we also really want to have a higher level of transparency and outreach. And I think these are some of the things that Chief Justice Gantz were really focusing on. The issue of transparency is a powerful one if you're really talking about um, delivering equal access to justice. And thank you, Pamerson. And we know that we can't do our work in this area in absence of the world around us. So it's particularly important that we consider the circumstances that we all live in and, and, and our communities. So how do we get here? You know, what, what brought us here? Well, interestingly enough, um, soon after I became Chief Justice of, of the trial court in, in 2013, 
Um, and, and we began this in, in earnest around that time. But we weren't. We knew we had a problem, but we didn't quite know how to get to it. And the reason why we knew we had a problem is that we had judicial evaluations that were being conducted, and judges of color were concerned that uh, they were being judged unfairly and more harshly than their white counterparts. And women felt the same. Women, female judges as well. And we had an analysis done of the responses for our judicial evaluations, and and lo and behold, um, we had some data that said yes, in fact. There was bias, uh, unconscious or overt um, bias in the way those uh, judicial evaluations were done. So I, I said to myself, well, if judges are feeling that way, then what must employees be feeling and what must the public be feeling as they are interacting within our trial court? So um, we issued an RFP, uh, which is a request for a proposal, because my then court administrator and I, frankly, I had done some research and the research was telling me that one off you know, seminars on bi uh, bias and unconscious bias was not going to do it. It just wasn't going to push us to where we needed to be. And in fact, in many instances can sometimes um, do more harm than good. So we engaged with a professional who has over the course of time helped us develop our capacity. Pamerson talked a little bit about leadership, and why leadership is important. It's tremendously important. And I define leadership in a very broad manner. I'd like to encourage leaders throughout our court system. It's not just people like myself, people like Pamerson, but it could be an office manager who is really being a leader within his or her office. You know, we want to embrace the leadership and we want to empower people. So we've developed a training and training modules to help develop leadership capacity to really lean in to be able to have difficult conversations not to shy away, to be able to become proximate, proximate with each other, proximate with our communities, and to be able to have the difficult and uncomfortable conversations around race. For a while, it took us a long time. We kind of pussyfooted around and we talked about race, but we didn't acknowledge the fact that there is racism within our organization. And unless and until we actually acknowledge it, it's hard to, act, to, to, to really be able to get to it. So we're really pretty proud of it. We've got uh, modules that um, all of our leaders are able, we've trained over 120. In addition to the cultural proficiency champion, we've trained a number of individuals in our organization to do trainings, to engage in discussions, whether it's brown bag lunches, um, lots of different things to be able to address the race. Our superior court, uh, just recently did a 21 day challenge where for 21 days they issued to each other um, and identified articles, videos, opportunities that they could um, talk to one another about issues of race, diversity, and those kinds to keep it constantly within your minds to be able to consciously talk about it um, instead of just sitting on the frustration and sitting on the uncertainty about how to do it. So in addition to developing that program, which we now have online with a variety of uh, modules um, and continuing to do the, the, um, the actual training, which is essentially a two and a half day training, we've obviously had to adapt as have all of you as we're here and we're in this virtual, um, you know, we've had to adapt and, and change our training into virtual trainings. Um, so we did an all court judges conference on race and implicit bias. 2015. Um, we established race um, and implicit bias committees throughout our organization at varied, various different levels, including probation, including security. So our security department um, has their own, and they each have representatives on the overarching trial court um, diversity, equity, and inclusion or, uh, or bias uh, committees. We've got a signature counter experience, which is an interactive um, uh, program that we have deployed to all of our courthouses. And I mean, we have a hundred courthouses in the Commonwealth and many, many more um, divisions within the courthouse. And we have done the trainings in person to all of them. We've now shifted because we've now had to put it into an online training, with, which looks a little bit different. And we call it signature counter experience, but it's a really train a training on customer service, including diversity uh, and inclusion because we need to be reflective of individuals that come before us. For instance, we train about 
It may be that someone from a different culture may look down and people may think they're being disrespectful. When, when in fact, in, their, in that person's culture, looking down is actually a matter of respect. So we are teaching people to be more introspective and, and to be able to open their minds to look at what, what, what matters to other people. Pamerson has been the driving force be behind our cultural proficiency champions. In 2017, he developed this program um, and really ran with it. He really ran with it in a way that is extraordinarily powerful. He's been able to empower all of these people to live this every day, not just we started off with it for a day, but they live this every day. They teach their colleagues about how to engage. They, they, they talk about it. They call people out when things occur um, and step up when they need to step up to be able to address um, uh, things. I'm gonna, we're going to talk a little bit about how, culture, how we evolved to Cultural Appreciation Week. Um, as part of our strategic planning, uh, we've developed um, a diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, domain. Um, and that, in fact, um, uh, it wasn't enough to just embed it into our strategic plan. We had to be more intentional about exactly what we were going to do in terms of the diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative. We have an actual office. We have a five-person office, which I think is unusual for a trial court. It is solely dedicated to this work. Um, and as part of this work, we do external and internal town halls where we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we talk specifically externally about, um, about race. We go into our communities, talk about how they experience our courts, what suggestions they have about what we can do different. At the onset of the pandemic, it caused us to go externally to some of our, our uh, most forcefully hit communities because there were a number of things going on. Many of those communities um, are, are, have significant diverse populations and people were being self-help evictions. People weren't being able to access the courts. So we went to the, the communities themselves and, and told them, we're here for you. We're able to help and, and help you handle some of these situations. Transgender training. We have an online transgender training. It's been very popular. We've done our workforce analysis. We do an annual diversity report. We've done two access and fairness um, surveys that we actually solicit and send out to our uh, the people that we serve. Um, the first time, uh, predictably, individuals of color, and most importantly, African-American individuals scored the lowest. Hispanic only slightly higher, uh, but both were significantly below um, uh, uh, white individuals. And so it showed us that we have work, work to do. But our overarching theme really is that we are committed to racial equity and to justice, and that it really lies in our commitment to equal access to just justice for, for all individuals who come to us. And it really is about providing a dignified environment so that all people who walk into our court feel safe, feel like they know uh, where they're at, what they can do, and that um, that they see people that look like them. We're not there yet. We're, we're on a journey. And I suspect if you're just starting, many of you might at the, be at the beginning of your journey, you might be in the middle, or you might be further along. But the bottom line is, is our job is never done and that we are committed to strengthening the work um, that we do. Chief, um, I, I just want to mention that you know, in, in, when, in your previous slide here, we, we intentionally made sure we put residents of the Commonwealth because we, we, we know that we have a lot of non-citizens who are still residents of our Commonwealth and we're very intentional about being inclusive when we're talking about fairness and access to justice. We're really intentional about working to make sure that regardless of your status within the Commonwealth, we value you and we want to make sure that you have equal access to justice. And the main reason why we put our next slide, which is just to give you an idea about our workforce, race, and ethnicity, is data is really important. We are firmly committed to data and everything we do because it really helps inform us. The Harvard study I talked about really is it is going to help us inform uh, what we need to do. But this workforce, race, and ethnicity shows us where we move forward and where we don't and where we need to 
uh, focus our attention. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the purpose of this really is just, you know, on average that, you know, about 25% of our workforce is diverse um, here in the Commonwealth. We are about 58% of all of our employees are female. Um, you could see, you know, without really drilling into this, the breakdown of, of numbers by male, female. But, but in essence, we have made the, the fastest growing group of employee hires that we've had and we've over the last three years um, or four years has been in our Hispanic or Latino populations. They continue to be hired. The, the African-American population has pretty much, you know, it sort of stays stagnant. We saw increases from in amount of female population from 2008, 17, but you saw the increase up through 2016, 17, so, um, and however, it is sort of slowed down in 2020. But we know that we have work to do. We continue to focus on making sure. Um, and one way we have done that, that it is very difficult now, almost all of our departments and our HR department continues to work this. All of our interview panels must be diverse across the board. We need to make sure that every candidate pool has a diverse um, representation across the board. So we're working really intentional about how we approach our hiring and our promotional practices across the board. We find these as fundamental to how we improve diversity. And one of the issues that we have really focused on based on the collection of data is promotional opportunities. We yeah. know that at the middle management level, we don't have enough diversity. So it's particularly important for us to really uh, enter into and have a mentorship, mentoring program for our yeah. employees, all of our employees, mm -hmm. not just our employees of color but to, to build their strength and their capacity so that they can move into middle management and then potentially uh, upper management. But it has to be intentional because our numbers, if you looked at our numbers collectively and compared them to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you would say, oh, they're doing pretty well. But then if you drill down and you see that a large percentage of our persons of color are in facilities and security. So in my way of thinking, that's not necessarily a win. I think it's a win. It's definitely a piece of a win, but we need to make sure that in other areas of our organization that we ensure that we provide individuals of color with opportunities. So this next slide, the chief just talked about, we, you know, we did it, conducted a, we do an annual um, diversity report and here, one of the things that I thought was really important to share, and I think this just highlights what the chief was talking about, we did an impact of differential treatment within the, the trial court. And here is a report or some feedback that we got from any number of employees when it came to the ability to do the job, job satisfaction and relationship with co-workers. And you realize that when, when age was factored in, we noticed that we, we saw that 57% of employees saw this, some level of dif differential treatment. Some 60% um, reported some level of, you know, of job satisfaction that it had an impact on that when it comes to relationship with their coworkers. And as you look at this across the spectrum, we saw, we saw that there were some impacts or issues of disability in terms of how they were treated and viewed by their coworkers or colleagues or supervisors. Ethnicity was also an area where we saw more than half of our employees you know, referencing the issues of differential treatment as it relates to, and more than 50% of the employees that were surveyed in the survey. When it came to gender, we noticed a lot of our female employees also re um, raise issues of differential treatment when it came to impact. So, they, so the ability to do their job from a, from a, from a gender perspective, 58% of those surveyed reported issues with, 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 with differential treatment. When it came to job satisfaction, that number grew to 66%. And when it came to issues of relationship with coworkers, so we understand and know that we've got to continue to use this data to drill down in our ability to really build an inclusive work environment and culture. When it came to race, we also saw that, that, that there was also these issues around differential treatment. And, and so as an organization, I think we are beginning to you know, as you become more diverse as an organization, that's an important element. But really, how you build inclusivity, how you build um, equality, and then how you get ultimately to that equity conclusion where all of your employees feel valued, engaged, and appreciated, and all of the um, input, insights, 
um, are valued as uh, alone at the same lines and spectrum as their white co-workers. We know that we have to get to that point and we understand as an organization that we have work to do. And that's part of what Chief Justice Gann was talking about when he says we have to be able, we have to have enough courage to really handle the truth. Now, we were talking, or, or we really wanted to talk to you about our cultural proficiency champions. And when we started this initiative back in 2000, it was born out of our strategic plan 2.0 in 2016. And, you know, we created the cultural proficiency champions in the role description in 2017. I remember saying to the entire group, and we had about 105 then, that we are going to change the trajectory of the Massachusetts trial court based on the work that you were doing. And I think the chief and, and many other employees would acknowledge that. We've got more than 200 trial court and 225 employees. They run the gamut from our entry level uh, probation or, or, or administrative case specialists right up to, to our highest level management positions and supervisory positions. They're in the district court, juvenile, superior, probate, family, housing, land court. They're in the probation service. They're across the security facilities, jury commission, Office of Community Corrections, and these are all departments within our fiscal and HR office. And the goal is that we really want to infuse cultural competence and cultural proficiency across every spectrum or every aspect of the Massachusetts Child Court. So all of these, they're trained in issues of race and implicit bias, LGBTQ, IA, racial and ethnic disparity, gender and sexual orientation, religious affiliation, physical abilities, and then cross-cultural communication. I, I was a chief probation officer a number of years ago, and I had a probation officer who was getting into these sort of arguments with the probation because the probationer wouldn't look him in his eye. And this was a young black male. And I said to him, have you ever engaged with this young man and realized that in some neighborhoods in his areas that if he looked and had eye contact with people across the street or in certain neighborhoods, it may be viewed as a challenge? and therefore it could result in a death sentence. Do you realize that him not looking in your eye may be a sign of respect? Maybe you should engage him in those conversations. And so part of this idea of cross-cultural communication is to really understand that how we engage and communicate with some of our the people that we work with is an important part of messaging to them that, that they're respectful. We, we I had another instance where a probation officer was upset that a woman from a Sunni Muslim background refused to shake his hand. And what he would have didn't realize and what she conveyed and her husband conveyed that within her culture, within her religious set, it was important that women did not have physical contact with men who were outside of their family. So there's small little things that we may ignore, but really but cross-cultural communication is an important part of, of what we do when we talk about cultural proficiency champions. So our champions are really trained to engage at the local level to look at things that speak to inclusion and focus on how we can become a much better trial court. Can I add something, uh, can I add something here, uh, Pamerson? And that is, yeah. we talk about physical abilities. I think there's also um, abilities in different ways and trauma that many individuals who come to us come with you know, ACE, ACEs scores because they've suffered from adverse child experiences, even our employees, frankly. Um, and it may suffer a trauma. So we we established probably about a two a year or two ago uh, a trauma team in in the trial court. And I have to tell you that I've never had so many people volunteer to be on a on a committee as I had volunteer to be on this committee. And what is amazing about it is that in light of COVID, there's been a lot of trauma for employees and for the people that we serve. So that we've had to pivot and be able to address things like that. Two weeks ago when we lost Chief Justice Gantz, we had to pivot. We had a lot of people who were traumatized by that loss. And we had to do a number of Zoom calls to be able to address it. So it's about having your organization be able to be nimble and be able to address some, some of the issues that are before you. Yeah. So the role of the cultural proficiency champions in our, 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 our um, trial court in, in on any given day, if you sit in a meeting, with our champions, it, you know, is the real, it, for me, it's one of the more beautiful things you'll ever see. We've got employees from every race, class, creed, color, orientation, physical or ability, 
um, gender, gender orientation. And so it's one of the more empowering, empowering sites that you'll see. But the role of the champion is to work towards enhancing the trial court's commitment to all of us as employees, to our customers. And we, we, we don't view more often than that, we're trying to make sure we change the lexicon or the language around defendants. We see them as customers because they're entitled to a quality service experience and outcome. We also want to make sure that we are able to bring all of our employees together and, 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 and maximize um, user satisfaction. But we also want to make sure that they are culturally competent workforce. And when I talk about cultural competence is that knowledge acquisition. Really what we're interested in is, is all of our employees being culturally proficient. And when we talk about cultural proficiency, we're talking about a demonstrated capacity to work with and service the needs of any individual or any person that walks through a front door or comes in through the back door naturally through an arrest. But we want to make sure that we can service the needs of any individual um, that, that comes before a, court, a trial court or one of our agencies, offices or departments. The picture on the right, you'll see the chief. We are here, myself, with the Chief Diversity and Experience Officer to the far left, um, we, and Chief Justice Carey and the Commission of Probation, and we're providing uh, a trial court employee with an award as for his service as being a cultural um, proficiency champion. And he's a, 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 a community service worker out of our New Bedford, Bristol County area. Uh, Peterson, do you want to talk a little bit if any of the folks in our audience um, are interested in, in starting a program like this? Do you want to talk a little bit about what it was like for you to begin the program in 2017 and then what kinds of things you have to do to build up to make it happen? So part of what we were, so this was born out of our strategic plan. So I was in charge of within the probation service. How do we go about building workforce diversity and cultural competence? And so part of what we did, we, we created a, a group of individuals, about 12 to 15 individuals that formed a workforce diversity and cultural competence committee. And there, and, and, and so one group was broken down into customer service experience and outcomes. One was focused on workforce diversity. Um, the other group was focused on, on recruitment and hiring. So we broke it down into four, but we really recognized that there was a shortfall here. What do we do internally to make sure that we've got people on the ground who are trained in every office and department, that they can be able to, one, engage in conversations about race and racial justice. They can engage in conversations around issues that point to, if you go to most courthouses in Massachusetts still, you will look on the walls and you will see pictures of predominantly all white old men. And we see that as an exclusionary sign to many of our employees of color or to defendants who are looking at the wall and saying, well, how do I relate to that experience? So we wanted to make sure we have individuals in every department who can talk about issues of race and racial justice, cultural proficiency, cultural competence, who can develop training on, um, uh, on, on LGBTQIA issues or any aspect of diversity. But we also wanted to have resident experts when there are issues in an office around issues of diversity that can, be re can help a manager navigate those. And some of them are managers. So they were able to talk through this. So we sent out, we developed a role description of what that would look like. We wrote out into employees asking individuals who would be interested in volunteering. And within two weeks of putting out a call, we had more than 150 individuals from all sorts of, all different departments who were interested in volunteering to take on, on the role. And so we started there and we, we decided that in order to, to really make this, we wanted to plan an event that would celebrate the richness of the diversity and the cultures that we had having the trial court. And so we came up with an event that chief, I don't want to steal that you'll talk about, but part of that is really, you know, looking at what the issues are and then the, developing a template. And we are happy to share with you all the role description, um, the, the write-ups, the types of trainings that we've undertaken to ensure that every one of our champions are trained and able to engage in these conversations. So even before we got to the inflection point of the George, of George Floyd and Brianna Taylor and Ahmed Abbury and Rashad Brooks and any number of other individuals who've been, we were looking to see how we can address these issues. If you are black or brown or Latino, gay or straight and playing the trial court, these are real issues that we come to work with every day. So we recognize that we needed to change the trajectory of the system by getting involved and making sure that we work with leadership at every level and, 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 and make sure that we have that permit decision-making where we talk to people at the ground level to understand how they're experiencing 
the trial court on a daily basis so that when we created the cultural proficiency champions, many of those were volunteers as well. But we wanted to make sure that we had a group of people who can speak about exactly what those experiences and then work towards changing the trajectory within the system. Thank you, Pamerson. And so this project really um, provided for an opportunity. If you're looking at public trust and confidence in your, uh, in your court system, it, this is a win-win. It's a real opportunity to showcase your court uh, and, and showcase what it is that you do uh, within your court. So what you see in this next slide, um, which is um, I think the you did the, world, no, the cultural yeah. You did the role description, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so so this, this, next, the next slide is Cultural Appreciation Day, September 28, 2017. And I love, I think this is my favorite. The beauty of the world lies in the diversity of its people. I have that um, in my office and in, in, you know, actually in my office at home because I love it so much. I think it's, it's just really reflective. Um, and as a result of what happened, this was a one day event that Pamerson sort of, you know, it was the first time we did it and we did it for one day. And um, of course that wasn't a, enough. I found out that Connecticut did it for a whole week. So I said to Pamerson, heck, we, we have to compete. So we <laughs> need to do it for a whole week. And yeah. it really took off, but it was an opera, a win-win for everyone. I mean, it engaged everyone within the organization. People cooked, they brought their ethnic dishes in, shared it. Um, shared it with more than just staff because we brought the public in. Anyone who came in for their court case was was welcome to to grab a bite to eat um, and and whatever. They participated in um, events. We had school children do artwork for us. We had community dancers. Um, we even had the Woo Sox, who it's the farm team for the Boston Red Sox come in. And uh, I think we even had, what's what's his name for the Red Sox? So, I mean, it's a big win. Puppy. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's a big fun event, but it's, yeah. and we bring resources in. Our sheriffs come in um, with their own resources, substance use um, resources, uh, you know. Mental we, health. Yeah. Mental health. We bring, we get, you know, folks that, that, Donate, um, donate things to to these events. Uh, it's really a uh, it's a big uplifting experience. But I'll share with you one one year. Uh, it also illustrated that at times, you know, we still we know we have work. We had an event where one manager only let his employees participate in the event for a very short period of time. And so it generated an opportunity to have a discussion about what what was going on because the the employees of color were having issues um, with the fact that they were only allowed, I think it was a half an hour or something. So they weren't allowed to even use their lunch break to be able to participate. So we've moved on significantly from, from there, but it again gave us the opportunity um, to, to have a discussion. So, um, do you want to talk a little bit about about you know what how we morphed it because you really designed how it how it morphed into cultural appreciation week and how you pick your sites which are the major sites? Yes. So what we do, you know, so so this next slide really talks about how you know what what is cultural appreciation week and and as the chief just mentioned and I don't want to give Connecticut more credit than we did because it was only their judiciary. Or, or Supreme that did it. We are doing it for not no knock against Connecticut. I love you all. I like come down visit. We see your programs because we think you got some fabulous stuff there. But we wanted to, you know, in terms of expanding it to a week, and the chief just talked about it. We really wanted to make sure that all employees had an opportunity to participate in it, and it was left to the local courthouses and offices and departments to really structure how they wanted to do it. But for us, we see this as the signature trial court event when it comes to looking at diversity and we want to move beyond just the spectrum of race. Um, we wanted to look at all of the other factors that we looked at, including age, physical ability, gender, religion, sexual orientation, and marginalized status of folks from disadvantaged backgrounds. And the reason we say marginalized because we have retired the word minority in terms of us for the trial court. I've been trying to preach that because in the pejorative, minority means less than. And I'm a big guy. I'm six feet, 260. There's nothing minority about me. I'm a massive guy. So I want you to view me 
in, in all of my dimensions. So, so I get away from that concept of the whole word of Bernard. But again, part of this is we really want to promote, we bring community groups in, we bring community events in, we bring our providers and mental health and substance abuse, um, all of our schools. We try to make sure that we want to reflect that. We want to show you a different side of the trial court. We really want to engage you in about equal access to justice. And part of this is getting to understand what resources we have in the community, how we can be better on this, how we can be better knowledgeable of those, but then how we maximize the skill sets of our employees, marrying with those resources. And so cultural proficiency week, cultural appreciation week is really the highlight of trying to bring all of those things in and celebrate them together. Um, so it's really for us an infusion of culture along with what we do here in the trial court. So, so, so this would you can talk ahead, a little bit about 18. 2018. So, 2000, so 2018, we really wanted to, you know, uh, we missed the word from here, but it really was about embracing and, and celebrating our, our, different, our similarities and differences. And part of what we were trying to get champions to do, what we really got the champions to do was to find out those things in your community that are different, that we really never really see and experience in the trial court, build a theme around that and then make sure that we as employees celebrate that. And we saw in our employees, in addition to, you know, um, talking about the differences, we shared video montages. We talked about others' cultures. We shared foods, recipes, dance, music. We, we wanted to really, um, we also wanted to draw in more schools and, and other in, uh, um, agencies into the mix. And so part of going out and talking about embracing and celebrating our different similarities and differences was to really expand cultural creation beyond the doors of the trial court. Because in 2017, as much as we brought some schools in, we really wanted to blow the doors off and bring in a lot more agencies into participate in the Cultural Appreciation Week in 2018. And during, it's my favorite week of the year because I get to go, each day I get to go to a different location or sometimes multiple locations. And they're usually the seminal events that, that really, you get. we get a lot of uh, local uh, press um, related yeah. to it. And the, the purpose of the press is really to educate folks um, and to show that we as a court system are part of the communities that we serve. So that's particularly important to us. So, so the chief just that we have five, and on average, we just at random, we pick a number of sites and, and where we want to make sure we get as much leadership as well as as much support for those. And more often than not, we have a number of court locations where you will have superior court, district court, housing court, land, land court, and probate. So we tried to link the um, celebrations because you have all of these court departments working out of the same complexes or justice centers. And so we showcase not only, you know, the diversity within that court, the, those court departments, but we also looking to expand it and show, of course, the diversity within those communities and court district that they serve, which more often than not are countywide. The district courts may handle a number of different courts and you may have seven or eight local district courts in the county. And then you'll have one superior court, one probate court and one housing court that may cover all of those. So we're trying to draw in all of the different pieces there. So, Chief, this is your next slide and one of our favorites. Yeah, it is. And the other thing you should know is that we have at least one naturalization ceremony each year. Last year, we had two, um, which for those of you that have ever participated in a naturalization ceremony, it brings tears to your eyes. It's so incredibly um, moving and powerful. Um, so it's great. So in 2019, um, our, our theme was being who you are in the world as you are. And it was really a celebration of who we are in, as, as individuals and who we are collectively. So it was really embracing, uh, you know, uh, our own innovation and creativity and uh, really embracing, uh, you know, each other. Um, you know, the chief just mentioned the um, naturalization ceremonies. And, and so we've had, this year we will have even in the with, with the COVID pandemic, we're going to have a naturalization at the Fall River Justice Center, which is in the southern part of our state. And the goal, and we will be doing about seven or eight um, naturalization ceremonies in the outdoor, in the garden, properly social distance. But the power in all of that, I also was once an immigrant, and I was here illegally about um, 30, 
five years ago. So these ceremonies, those naturalization ceremonies are probably some of the most powerful things that you will ever see because you get new immigrants that, that are swearing. And so we're looking to do that and they have the ability to vote. So we hope they're right now registered so they can vote right away. But it's a whole different story. So this year, um, for obvious reasons, we are onto a virtual platform. So we have to do yeah. this virtually. Um, so we have got a number of things planned, including a, a panel um, of all of the chief justices. We have seven trial court departments. So including myself and, and uh, the other chief justices, we're doing a panel on why this is important to us, why this work is important to us, and why it's crucial at this time in uh, our the history of our country. So um, our theory or our slogan this year is we rise by lifting others. So we thought this was a particularly um, poignant um, way to approach uh, approach this, especially given the pandemic um, and, and the things that are happening that we really needed to focus in on the nurturing side of what we what we do and who we are. The funny piece about this is we got this with this slogan from a <laughs> stylist. This is how diverse <laughs> that we have in terms of people that it was an immigrant and I think it was Fall River who, Fall River, yes, it was. who participated in our cultural appreciation um, week last year. Um, and she was, he was right next to a woman who makes dolls and, you know, it's really fabulous um, type work. So I saw this and I said, that's our theme for next year. Um, yes. So you never know where you're going to see it, where it's something that's really inspirational. Um, uh, you want to talk a little bit about the plans since you're into so, the weeds on the plans for this? So the the plans um, the plans that we are we're looking to do this year really in, from a virtual perspective is really to take go back to the inflection point and having uh, engaging conversations about race and racial justice. We want to be able to get employees to talk about how they feel. We want managers to understand it isn't just about the work that a lot of our employees are impacted by events and trauma. So, 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 so we want them to be able to engage the impact of the COVID pandemic, pandemic on employees and their lives and their families. We've had a number. My, I can tell you personally, I've lost five elderly relatives and was never able to go back home to the Caribbean or where they were to visit. So we know that we've got a lot of people who are grieving and suffering. So we want to be able to talk about how can we support each other as employees, support our families, support our communities. We're doing any number of video montages um, where we are employees are talking about, again, some of the things that are important to us. We may want to talk about somebody we lost that we didn't have an opportunity to say goodbye to. And so we're trying to drill down into all of that, really to start to take care, of, talk to each other, how we can help each other. We also want to be talking about how we are building inclusive departments and just work through this year, really trying to address the trauma that we know that a lot of our employees and our families are experiencing um, at the local level. We're still having schools that are in session or that can donate artwork to provide artwork um, in a couple of locations employees are using you can see the globe in the background with the handprints employees are coloring handprints and they're putting some um, cultural facts race class gender dance music all of the things that they find important to them and that board will stand in the rest of the um, uh, in uh, some way prominently in the courthouse this year or in their local departments just as a sign to say you know, we know you're there. We know you might be working remotely. We know that you might be working in teams where you're not seeing each other, but we are still one community. We are still one core community. We are still going to celebrate regardless of the challenges. So this team this year, we rise by lifting others is by a gentleman by the name of Robert Green Ingersoll. And, and he spoke to the idea of how can you lend a helping hand? How can you help each other? And then we you marry it to the idea of justice and culture bridging the gap. We believe as an institution and as a trial court, we play a significant role in, in equity, in fairness, in impartiality, but also as a search, as a resource for our community. So this idea of justice and culture bridging the gap lift fits beautifully. We rise by lifting others. Uh, do you want to talk about the uh, leadership roles and supporting uh, cultural pr proficiency champions? We talked a little bit about this, um, but is there anything else you felt like you needed to mention, Tamerson? So, I, so part of what we do, um, so each this year, every chief justice has appointed within their office um, a, a, an individual who will help 
each district department, each court department or office or agency to help coordinate the events, share what the events are, provide insight. Now, on a typical year, we provide $250 to every department, um, and we have about 132 departments that are participating or courthouses that are participating in events. So, so it's, a, it's a good amount of money to help pay a lot of employees. Um, there, there are a lot of agencies that donate. One of the things that I forget to mention, Chief, was we have a massive food drive and it's properly socially distanced. People are donating items. The agencies are going to come by, desanitize and pick them up. Nobody really has to touch anything, which is one of the more powerful things. In Every year we have food drives around the state that, that donate foods and clothing to any number of homeless shelters in our communities. But the role of leadership is to make sure that we have a champion in every department, then make sure that they are able to be trained and then also make sure that those, those champions have opportunities to address issues, to be on staff meeting agendas, to talk about different issues, bring topics, bring trainings into the department. So we recognize that, you know, when, the, when we talk about mentorship, I, I also want to say this, more than 25 of our champions have been promoted to higher level positions um, within the trial court, some as up to the level of chief probation officer. We just had three champions that were promoted to chief. So it is also for me a recognition that if you do great work in these areas, it's also a potential growth opportunity for individuals who are looking to grow. But real leadership role is to really help, you know, provide the supportive environment where champions can focus on issues around diversity, equity, inclusion, and bring all of those issues to the forefront. So we've got a couple of more slides um, the, of substance, and then I want we want to open it up for questions. So I'm going to try to go through those pretty quickly. You know, we, we talked about $250. I mean, that's a win-win. We get greater mutual respect between our employees. We get teamwork. We get cohesiveness. We get happier employees. We get an increased motivation, you know, just improved morale and increased productivity. It's all a win-win. So... Um, you know, for short investment, it's just a terrific. Uh, to, yeah. And we have a stronger organization as a result of all of it. So, so, yeah. so I, I get, I mean, the employee benefits and, 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 you know, I think we just covered that. You know, we have a much happier, greater mutual respect, teamwork and cohesiveness, increased innovation. We know that diverse teams are, are much better producers because of the innovative ideas. Increased, increased productivity, we've seen that. Um, I know that we want to leave a few minutes to just see if we have questions, but here's where we really hone in chief on, on the community court and user benefits in a gritty. Yeah, oh, go yeah ahead. It's a, I mean, our communities are really important. Uh, obviously those are the individuals that we serve and the, our employees come from, from the community. So improving our cultural competency, getting to know the cultures within our, our community uh, and just a capacity to really meet the needs of those individuals that come into us. It's really an affirmation of the trial court's, um, you know, commitment uh, to serving those individuals. And it just, it, you know, it's a patchwork quilt of individuals that really is, is a delight to see. So in the last, you know, several years, myself and the chief and many of us get out to a lot of events but this remains for me the most defining photo all across our cultural appreciation celebration and these are probation officers and administrative staff from the chelsea district court and there are naked native ecuadorian dress which is really one of the most fantastic things that you will ever see performing traditional dance provide you know provide uh, foods um olga Lataruto. Laterulo is a probation officer in Chelsea District Court. She doesn't only, she also works for Univision. She teaches Spanish languages um, to individuals. She speaks, she teaches English to Spanish language speakers in the community to ensure that they can acculturate into the American process. Um, and then these are photos of any number of different locations around the staff. You know, Quincy District Court, you see a tr traditional Chinese dance. Um, the Brockton Municipal um, Court, the Boston Municipal Court have a native Dave Montenoag um, dance group that came through. And then you see the different celebrations here across the Commonwealth. And I, I'm just showing you these pictures. Real. 2018, we saw some of our court staff and employees that are celebrating. Uh, and every event has had mag the, the best food anywhere in the country on that day or on any given day are here across the Commonwealth. 
Again, this is from 2019. And again, if you're thinking we have eight, last year we had more than 85 celebrations in different locations around the Commonwealth. The first year we started out with 60 last year. Um, and, and so last year we had more than 80 different celebrations. And if you really think about it, 80 celebrations come um, with a combine of more than 125 departments because we've got community correction centers, we've got offices, and then we've got courthouses that sometimes have four or five different court departments. So this is just a sample, and I will go to see if there are any questions. There are not a lot of questions, Chief, so. Are there any questions? No, um, no, it just, you know, there's an insightful thanks, but beyond that, they're not, I think we might because they're last of the day. Well, um, I guess uh, we'd just like to thank you for your uh, patience and your uh, listening to us. We're, we're excited about the work that we do. We think it's important for trial courts across the country. Uh, it, it's a unique way of addressing issues of racism, addressing co uh, cultural proficiency and addressing diversity, equity and inclusion. And that um, we're happy to help in any way, should you uh, wish. You've got uh, Pamerson's really the brainchild behind all of this. So he's probably the best contact. Uh, should you seek any questions uh, on our presentation and cultural appreciation uh, week or uh, for that matter, on any of the initiatives that we mentioned, and we have a number of them uh, that we are engaged in in the, in the state of Massachusetts. So again, thank you, um, and thanks to NACOM for allowing us to participate. All right. Chief, we got some nice feedback here, so that is beautiful. But we want to say thank you. And just one last thing I will tell you, and it's uh, is Pamerson described his stature in terms of how big he was. Well, last year for Cultural Appreciation Week, I, I can tell you my stature, I'm five feet tall and <laughs> I weigh about 115 soaking wet. And so uh, we boxed. For several months before uh, the Cultural Appreciation Week, we boxed. Yeah. So, so, it, so was, it was interesting. I, I, I actually, what I was hoping to do that, you know, that the chief from that point on, when she go to a meeting and she had a dispute, she would be able to put her boxing gloves on the table and says, we can settle it. But, you know, the whole, it was really a beautiful opportunity to really engage because I think culture is more than just, you know, the conversation is about all of the different physical aspects that people bring. But the chief had a pretty mean right hand after about five, six months of training. So I thought it was powerful. And she was a good sport about it. So that was good. It gave people a little laugh. So sometimes you just have to put yourself out there um, and be willing, you know, be willing to do some things that might feel a little uncomfortable. Well. So thank you all. Thank you, Chief. Thank you all. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Look forward to hearing from you.